Uh, she is exemplary of the best that White Plains has to offer that Westchester County, and in fact our nation has to offer. She has dedicated herself over nearly two decades now to covering uh, stories in the media that matter. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of those studies have, uh, stories that she has covered have centered around crime. And that more or less uh, led her into a slightly different path of her career. Uh, but she has been involved in the media uh, for at least the last 15 years. And uh, we're extremely pleased that she came here today to lend her services and her expertise and to assist us with our forum today. Tanya Hutchins, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Um, watching that video was difficult for me because I quit the news business twice. And the reason was because I got tired of, of covering crime. So I can't wait until the day where we don't see those images ever again on television. We are going to introduce our panel here. And I'd like to thank everyone on the panel uh, for coming for this open dialogue. I love how this is a positive event. Um, and the whole reason that we are here is the, you know, the title is Rebuilding Trust, Strategies for Change. You know, how do we rebuild trust? So I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves um, for one to two minutes. I will start with Ken Williams on the end and, and briefly come down. Just tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and your background. Thank you for having me uh, today. My name is Ken Williams. I came from Boston, Massachusetts. I want to thank the Urban League. I want to thank Pace University for uh, having this panel discussion this morning. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a former law enforcement officer, homicide detective, um, 15 years. I've been in, was in law enforcement for about 20 years. And today I, uh, I do private consultancy work, wrongful death consultancy work with uh, lawyers across the United States. Um, the business itself was formed uh, this year. A lot of my case work is out of Florida today. But um, um, it's important, I believe, from my perspective and my experience, um, having been in law enforcement, uh, that uh, if we're going to be honest, we'd be honest very early. And uh, Brother Chamberlain was at the microphone earlier, and I just want to say that I am pro-good police officer, but I'm anti-bad police officer. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Tedesco and I'm here from the Detroit Police Department where I've served as chief for about the last four and a half years. Uh, I've been with the department overall for uh, going into my 39th year. Uh, I'm here today because I'm a founder, in our department at least, and a very um, urgent supporter of the community policing effort. And one of the goals that I have um, to men community relations, which our city suffers from, as do many others, is to stop having the community policing movement be thought of as, as a couple of special guys, a couple cops in a unit, but actually have to be the operational philosophy of the department as a whole. Very difficult to do, um, and that's why I think it's important that um, I get out to events like these um, to see what everybody else is doing, but also to speak the word of what I think needs to be done in a lot of communities. I, and I agree with Ken, I think if we're really going to promote community relations, we need to have a lot of painful, but honest dialogue. And I think the essence of community relations is transparency. And we're not going to get that by patting each other on the back. So I think we need to get it out, heal from the wounds, and move it forward. But I'm really very uh, complimented to be here today. And I, I think I'm going to take a lot away from here that I'm going to bring back home and use. So, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Skolnick, and, and by way of introduction, I was uh, awoken at 5.30 this morning uh, by my 20-month-old child uh, yelling my name as I've been traveling for five days. Uh, so I come here first as a father. Um, I come here second um, as a listener. Uh, I just returned from Ferguson yesterday uh, where I sat, uh, I traveled with Harry Belafonte and Danny Glover, where we sat for the past three days uh, listening uh, to about 100 young leaders on the ground in Ferguson, uh, who are not just fighting for justice for Mike Brown, but fighting for justice for this country and for us in this room. Uh, I want to recognize um, this group of young people 
uh, in this side of the room, and probably the answers lie within them, not within us in this panel. So I certainly want to recognize that at a certain point we allow them to speak uh, and hear their thoughts. I think they're from Austin High School, if I take a guess. I'm a John Jay High School graduate, so you guys beat us every single year. <laughs> So I'm going to let you all speak um, if I have a chance to do it you all. So thank you for having me. Hi, my name is Michael Goldman. I'm a captain with the Mount Vernon Police Officer. I currently serve as the Executive Officer of the Mount Vernon Police Department. Uh, I'm on the Police Department for 28 years. Started as a, obviously, patrolman and worked in emergency services. Moved up through the ranks, sergeant, lieutenant of the detective division and intelligence unit, and I uh, was recently promoted to February captain. And uh, where I serve now out of the office of the chief of police. Part of uh, what we look to do is to invite the community, and we need more community involvement in our police. And that's some of the stuff that we're looking at. That's what I'm hoping to find out here today is to engage more community involvement in the police department itself. Recruiting, with community outreach, and within the city of Mount Vernon, specifically we have that commitment to our commissioners and our mayor. Thank you very much for having us. Good morning. My name is Jimmy Bell. I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. I learned I was getting, giving you guys a chance to get over that Mississippi. <laughs> I'm a retired uh, professor of criminal justice and sociology and criminology for 45 years in higher education. I have uh, conducted police trainings in interpersonal and intergroup relations. I conduct research on minority, uh, uh, majority policing. Uh, I've done <clears throat> research uh, all across the globe. Uh, I've conducted a, a, a policing style called extended community policing long before the, community, the concept of community policing came into, into vogue. So I have some authority and experience, and, and I invite my good friend Damon Jones to Jackson every opportunity I get. <laughs> good morning. My name is Chris McNerney. I am the Chief of Police in the town of Greenberg, right next door. Um, I come from a diverse police background. I've worked in just about every division in the police department, from patrol to undercover narcotics to street crime. Uh, Detective Division, Internal Affairs, Staff Services. Um, I'm an attorney. I'm also an adjunct professor of criminology at Mercy College. And when I took over as Chief of Police in December 2013, uh, I am com was committed and still am committed to the community policing philosophy that the Greenberg Police Department has followed. Uh, we have what I believe outstanding relations with our community and I remain committed, so thank you. My name is Captain Vincent Muhammad. I'm the founder and CEO of the Peacekeepers Global Initiative and also founder of ENOTA Ad One Inc., which stands for Educating Neighborhoods to Obey Those Authority, which is a community sensitivity training and a law enforcement sensitivity training. I um, started the Peacekeepers about eight years ago, and we have 21 chapters throughout the country, one in London, England. And it was this very reason why we started the Peacekeepers, because we know that law enforcement by themselves cannot police the community. At the same time, I've been fortunate to train 13 police departments in sensitivity training. I don't know, I didn't get a chance to meet the new chief over in Detroit, but Detroit was the last department that I trained was the Eastern District. Under that time, Ella Bo Cummings was a chief, and uh, then it turned over to my friend Ralph Garvey, who was the, over the Eastern District. And I am a firm believer that in order for us to be able to fight crime and violence in our community. There must be a mutual respect between law enforcement and the community. Thank you.
Good morning. My name is Sandy Burnaby, and the first thing I want to do is to pay respects to the families to my left. Uh, I'm a white anti-racist community organizer for the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, and the name of that organization has never meant more to me, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Did an undoing racism workshop about 20 years ago and got to see <coughs> that this country was designed for me and my people, and that means that that's at the expense of others. I'm a social worker, been practicing clinical social work for 32 years, and what we also got to see is that human services is designed to tweak the system and keep trying to fix people rather than fix the systems that drive the problems. Mm, go ahead, sir. So, Alliance, which, which is an organizing arm in the New York City metro area. And in the past 10 years, we've put over 8,600 human service practitioners and educators through an undoing racism process. And we've populated human services and schools of social work in the city and in Westchester County. So we have a common definition, a common understanding, and mobilized to organize. And in this room, there are many, many people who are organizers. And we've learned that you can't talk race away, you can't teach race away. Undoing racism is a, is a verb and you've got to organize. And so that's why I'm here on this panel. And I'd like to thank Captain Dennis Mohammed for stepping in at this late notice um, in place of Officer Hampton. So we hope that he's okay, but thank you for stepping in. Since we are here to rebuild trust, let's start out with that first question then. How do we rebuild trust? Um, let's start with Ms. Burnaby. Me? Yeah. We'll go down the line on this one. Yeah. For me, building trust, building trust. We have to get that. We're not rebuilding trust. We're building trust. There's good reason for people of color in this country to not trust institution. Um, we're a colorblind nation, which means that we deny the role that race plays. There's not one academic degree that requires its professionals to understand racism, what it does to the community before they go out and work on community, and that includes policing. So a colorblind society keeps denying that, it keeps trying to catch the guilty one, catch the guilty one. But when we understand what racial equity means, when we're no longer colorblind and we see the data that rolls out the facts, then we turn the mirror inward and we understand that all institutions have to do some internal work. That's how you build trust, with integrity. When you, when you look inside and you say, every institution needs to take a look at how they perpetuate racial discrimination in the outcomes of every institution, including police. Captain Muhammad, what do you think? <clears throat> trust has to be built upon mutual respect. You can never establish trust if you don't respect the people that you believe that you're trusted to serve and protect. I believe that once we build mutual respect, then we can establish trust. That is one of the key important ingredients in a proper community and police relationship. When there's no respect, then there's no trust. The word respect comes from the Latin word respecto, which also means to give back. Until you're able to give back the respect that you receive and vice versa, we can never build trust. So I believe that mutual respect builds trust. I agree that Mutual respect is, is key. I also believe that communication and commitment are two, two vital parts as well. There needs to be open, honest dialogue, and there needs to be a commitment to do the best we can to make things right. Yeah. I think that uh, in order to build trust between the police department and the community, we have to demand that the police departments in America began to deal with what I call in the literature called procedural justice, with fairness and dignity. Now, there are two concepts related to that procedural justice. Legitimacy is one, and legitimacy is the judgment that people make about police officers being fair and just. But legality is what the courts and the Constitution demands. And until we get that, that there will be no trust between the community and the police. Captain Goldman? 
I trust the community. And the way I see it is that the police officers themselves with trust starts at basic encounters. Uh, we are talking about very tragic incidents here. Uh, but it all starts right at the very basic level, that first time that the police come to your house, or that first time he pulls you over. That interaction is what already starts how the conversation begins, and what the person that's pulled over from the person who's home is uh, uh, come into by the police. That is where that trust has to start, right at those basic encounters. And if we can have that dialogue start there with professionalism, with courtesy, with respect, as those encounters begin, then the language right there starts and moves right up from there. Thank you. Uh, allow me for a moment um, to, to bring an elephant in the room. Um, this is not about trusting the community. Um, this is about the trust in the black and brown community. White people trust the police because they're on our side. And I'm white, for the record. <laughs> um, these, these guys on the panel are my friends, but not our friends. And I know this is nothing personal against you as individuals, but as a system, I'm not targeting any individual in this room or, or on this panel, but as a system, we had slavery in this country that built this country on cheap labor and free labor. We then had the Jim Crow. Then we had the Civil Rights Movement, and after that, we needed cheap labor to create a war on drugs. That war on drugs is a failed war that targeted black and brown America. And if we want to talk about the police system, we can't just talk about the police in a vacuum. The police are there to serve a justice system that is not just. That is targeting black and brown people in this country. They're serving laws that are targeting black and brown people in this country. So how can you build trust? when you have a system that targets individuals. They don't target me. I can walk out of this building now with a kilo of cocaine in my backpack and a police officer will not stop me and frisk me and ask me for my papers and do I belong in this community. But any black person or brown person or woman who knows better than I do, because it hasn't happened to me, knows they are targeted by the police because of the color of their skin. So if we want to build trust, let's look at the system. I don't believe it's just bad officers in a, in, in a community or bad people in a community. It is a system that has created a cancer that has destroyed the fabric of the black community. And we're going to get into that more Sorry. because we're going to talk about it. I don't think there's a magic bullet for building trust. I think it takes initiative, and I think it takes initiative on both sides of the coin. Chiefs have to get out from behind their desk, get out and meet the people that they serve, be it breakfast clubs, community meetings, whatever. But the community has to come together also, but not only when there's something that's causing emotion, because when emotions are high, nobody wins. And then you have the finger pointing. So if you want to build trust, and the hardest thing I find about doing a community policing program is when times are good, is getting everybody to come together because nobody's interested. So you have to have the initiative to continue to meet, okay, over the course of time. As you get to know each other, you have some honest dialogue, you have trust. And, but the chief needs to set that example in a department, so what we're being very aggressive about in my agency is getting the cops out of the cars. So I'm restructuring the department and we're doing some things citywide that's freeing up officers to have more officers available to do those, just that. Um, get out, meet the people that you serve, let them get to meet you. And let's start to realize that we're all human beings and we're all part of one community. All right? And that's the start. I mean, you get to know each other so when the politicians and everyone else gets involved and they, and they want to pick a side to be on it because it's going to be most favorable for them at the time, it's that relationship of the people knowing the officer and having the confidence in the chief that he will demand accountability in an incident 
That's where you're going to get trust from on both sides of the aisle. But it really takes initiative on both to want that at 365 days a year and not just when you have an incident. I mean, the word trust is such a loaded question. Um, I'm going to try to handle it in three minutes. Myself, I am famous for walking around in a hoodie, sweat, sneakers, tank top, whatever. It's very easy to profile me, possibly, as looking suspicious. It wouldn't be reasonable, but it's easy to do. So what we have to do is we have to look at the fact that race has been long-standing in this community. It is being black, you can see me a mile away. Being white, I can see you a mile away. So race is very important when we talk about the dynamic of race. The fact that black people, brown people have been oppressed in this country for several hundred years. The fact that Title VII, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, enabled me as a black person to become a member of law enforcement in 1995 is a reality that we have to deal with because before 1964, it was predominantly a white male profession. So these are the things that if we're going to talk about trust, we're going to talk about community, we're going to talk about the changes that are, in, uh, that are necessary, we've got to go and look at the history, we have to accept the painful past, and we have to accept the fact that, that bad police officers are within those ranks, within those agencies, and that they're being protected by what's called indemnification. Can we answer, can we answer her question? I mean, to be real, but she yes. has a specific question. I think let, me, officer, let me answer it. I'm sorry. I, I, think, I think she asked the officers to yeah. answer those questions. Yeah, how are the policies and procedures monitored, and then how are they enforced? Well, I can tell you, Lieutenant Greenberg, that when we detain someone, stop, stop and frisk legal threshold, that means that there's got to be reasonable suspicion that criminality is afoot, that the crime uh, had occurred, is occurring, or is about to occur. Uh, our officers have to prepare a report, and those reports are reviewed by supervisors. And I can tell you as a supervisor, I had seen reports that I thought did not meet the legal sufficiency for the stop. And we would pull the officers in, and we'd say, officer, did you leave something out of your report? Because based on what you wrote, what you documented, this appears to be an unjustified stop. And we would retrain that officer. And the goal is we have documentation and we have training, we have accountability. Now you mentioned training, and I know race has come up in this issue. Are there departments here that have sensitivity training? Yes. And how does that work? Cultural diversity training is something that uh, we try to do. Police officers get it as part of the mandated state curriculum at the police academy. Uh, we try to do it in service. Uh, I think I can speak for most police uh, administrators. We would like to do more training. Training, we welcome it. We have challenges with doing uh, training that's not mandated by the state. You know, our challenges include uh, budgetary reasons, uh, scheduling reasons, union reasons. So we do what's required, and we always try to uh, implement training that is applicable at the time. You know, in this case, stop and frisk has been a, a hot topic. Domestic violence has been a hot topic. Bloodborne pathogens is now a hot topic. So we have a lot that we try to implement in addition to the mandatory state training. And speaking of training, okay. I approached the uh, Jackson city mayor in the early 70s and the city of Jackson was predominantly white and I asked to they had very few African-American police officers and I asked to conduct uh, diversity training and personal relations training and I was denied you know first of all he said we, we don't have any money to pay you I said well I'll do it for free <laughs> And I, as I was telling Ken earlier, they allowed me one hour of, of interpersonal relations training. Now let's really get to the black elephant in the room. <laughs> if some of you, most of you are too young to remember the Kerner Report. And that report issued in 1967 stated that 
America is moving toward two societies, one black, one white. And that the key to all of the disturbances in the 60s, what quote the media called riots, uh, were a result of white racism in the police department. That's the kind of report. And I don't think anything has changed much since that time. Now that's, I'm taking a personal prerogative because I review the literature all the time and I look at all of the data and, and all of the disparities and you witness it every day. So the, the real elephant in the room is race. And I think we need to address that. Captain Goldman, let me ask you this. This is also, this was a second question from an audience member that is related. What steps, if any, have been taken to remove the potential for racial violence from policing? Having more community involvement, recruiting from within the community. And he, he's right. We are all have the uniform, we all are from the community. I'm from Mount Vernon. I still live in Mount Vernon. I serve in the community that I grew up in. Um, pulling more people in from the community gives it more representation. But it's it's also defining admission within the police department. It starts at the top and then is moved down and it's, it's spread out all the way down to the very basic levels of policing. And using that opportunity to define who our bad guys are, as opposed to casting a wide net, which is elite, that kind of uh, approach is what needs to be done. It's defining what the needs are, defining who the people are that are causing the problems and using that knowledge, that intelligence, that, to serve the community, not by just going out there and issuing a million tickets or a million um, arrests. That's not the kind of thing that's about quality or quantity. And that's what we're trying to do. How often does this training take place when it comes to sensitivity training? Is it something where they're just getting it coming out of the academy, or is this something that's annual? We. We, they, get, they get what they get in the police academy uh, overall, and then uh, we haven't had any in about a year and a half now that we're coming back and getting uh, diverse. May I say something? Yes. 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 Dr. Bell, I would like to add to what you, you framed out. The, the use of the word sensitivity training and cultural competence is almost an insult to what we're talking about. We're talking about straight up racism that is killing people in every system, but particularly a system that has professionals with guns. Many times, too many times, even people who live in a community that's being impacted by multiple systems failure don't even understand what's going on and have internalized the dominant message that they are bad, they are the problem, they are the criminals, and that we have to clean ourselves up. But unless we understand what racism is, how it functions, we have to know the what and the why behind poverty and poverty disproportionately impacting communities of color. We have to know how people are made poor and why we see multiple health and safety problems in concentrated communities made hypersegregated, made poor, segregated housing. We still have that problem with housing. Segregation and discrimination in employment, so in child welfare. We have to understand and be clear about the what and the why behind what we see in community so we don't keep blaming the community for the circumstances, but work towards a collaborative that begins to ameliorate the problems. But right now, we have people who, because we don't have an understanding of racism, still refer to people in community as those people. Mm -hmm. I've heard people refer to those people as animals. And we need to be honest about this. We don't have a common definition and understanding about what racism is and how communities show up in a particular way over and over and over again, no matter where. It's not the people, it's the arrangement. And so that's where this understanding of structural racism has got to be the basis if we're going to do anything. Sensitivity training is just maintaining a white supremacist ideology and making us 
be happy about or something. I don't even know what this is. It's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that we are all on the same page and that's grounded in history and not be afraid. We want to achieve racial equity and you can only achieve equity when you're not colorblind and you're educated, including people who are most impacted by racism. We talk about the people who are most impacted. Um, one of our next questions from an audience member is what community partnerships are out there now working with law enforcement? Um, what programs exist to help foster the relations between the community and the police? Do they exist? Jim is here from NAFI. We know that in Seattle, we know that there are, are samples, that there are examples from around the country, but these are people who have been brave, brave enough to understand that racial implicit bias is in every single one of us, and we have to get to the bottom of that. But NAFI is here in Westchester doing some work, and it's grounded in undoing racism, understanding. And I know that the city of Seattle with their 2020 vision for new policing. But I guess what we're saying is, is that it doesn't exist here. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, does anybody know of any other community partnerships? Absolutely. We, we work with our local clergy. I see Pastor Williams that just uh, came in. We work with our civic associations um, and other community meetings. Part of the community policing philosophy is to have that open dialogue, communication, and commitment from both sides. Now here's the, the hardest question of all. Like, what do we do differently that we haven't done yet up until this point so that we can create change moving forward? One suggestion is that you open up the police training academies because the training academies contribute to all of this. That's right. They contribute right. to what I call and what the literature refers to as a culture of occupational culture. And that occupational culture is embedded in police officers to act a certain way, to silent code, to protect each other, to look the other way. And who are the bad people and who are the good people? That's an occupational culture. Now, you can have your police officers on, on the panel to talk about the occupational culture and how they perceive it. Anything you'd like to add? You know, I, I can tell you that there are bad cops. We know it. There are, there are bad doctors, bad bad lawyers and, and bad members of clergy. Our goal is to identify them. And get rid of them. That's our goal, to identify them and get rid of them. That's right. Okay. Here, here's the challenge of thinking face in this country, not just in this county or in this state. You have states now, just as a week ago, that legalized marijuana. A week ago, right? You have a city that I reside in, New York, that just changed the law on a misdemeanor or a felony in possession of marijuana just three, two days ago. So you have folks who have been arrested, convicted, and sentenced on laws that now are legal, who are still in prison today. You have folks in Colorado and Denver who are in prison for marijuana possession, who if they had marijuana possession on them today, it would be legal and they would not be imprisoned. You have folks in New York City and Rikers Island, in, right now in Rikers Island, who are, who are in prison, in jail, excuse me, for marijuana possession, that if they're caught tomorrow, would not go to Rikers Island, right? So, so when I look at stop and frisk, they say marijuana is a gateway drug. Marijuana is a gateway drug to incarcerate somebody for a long period of time. So you, so you stop a 13-year-old child, right? You stop a 13-year-old child, and that, that young man has a dime bag of weed inside their pocket, or has a blunt in the back pocket. That kid goes to, to jail overnight. That kid in his head says, you know what? I was scared of jail before the first time I went, but it wasn't too bad. I did one night. He gets picked up two weeks later with another dime bag of weed. He does the weekend in jail. He says, "Damn, I can do a weekend." However, um, we still all have the same issue when it comes down to policing in our communities. They go by courtesy, professionalism, respect, CPR, standard on the cars. I believe everyone stands for that same kind of title, which you know we're in the belief of this false advertising because when the police are hired by the community to do a specific job to protect, and they're not doing that job, then we have to put a system in, in place where the community can screen the officers that are assigned for that particular part of the community, if you understand what I'm saying, where we could actually say, all right, well, this officer, 
he's been on the force for X amount of years, this is how many shooting this officer has. It's like a resume to the community because it's like they're hired by NYPD, but they work for us, if I'm not mistaken. Is that, is that correct? All right, so I mean, and, and in all due respect, I mean, for us paying our tax dollars as, and also I'm, I'm sure everyone's here as a registered voter, um, you know, it, it's, there has to be some kind of system that has to, that can be established that we as the people can actually screen each officer that is placed in our communities. Because now we know that we're not dealing with someone that has a mental issue. We're, dealing, we're not dealing with some, someone that might have some kind of a war flashbacks because they're an ex-veteran and they just came from Vietnam and now they, or not Vietnam, um, Saudi Arabia, you know, overseas in, in Afghanistan, whatever the case may be, they come from war and they, you know, they, now they're officers and all of a sudden they're working in our community and they're they so walking around like this. So are you asking, so, is there a way for the community to vet the officers that are working in the community? Yeah, that's, that's what the, the first one, right? Okay. And the second one is, I wanted to ask the community, is there a way that we could establish a, a community mediation service where we could police our own communities? Because technically, that's what it's about. Because um, it's, it's not policing our community, but it's actually mediating in our communities, preventing things from happening before they happen being able to form relationships with one another so that we can feel the comfortability to go to our neighbor because that's what it's about. It's, it's, it's a neighborhood and somewhere along the line, the neighbors got left out of the hood. Okay, so let's see if we have any questions. Is there a way for the community to vet the officers that work in the community? When, uh, when a new officer society, the young officer society comes on, there's an 18 month probationary period. And uh, that's, that is the vetting process, and that's where it starts right there. Um, the training. You said it's 18 months is what? 18 months is their probationary period. And that is that is the actual vetting period. We, we will, we have um, dismissed officers that weren't up to snuff. Or up to so when you have this, during this 18 months, let's say they, they're in White Plains, and um, they got a complaint, how many complaints could, could uh, validate them not Making a probation period. It's not a number of complaints oh. specifically that will do it. There's a lot of other uh, dynamics and, and things that go with it. How they interact with the probationary, how the probationary police officers interact with the community. There's gauges. There's they're, they're being watched by senior officers. If they're having difficulty, more training is given, and uh, um, and different approaches are offered to that. And if it's if it comes to a point where there is it's obvious that this isn't the right fit for him, then, then separation from the One of the things you just said is they're being watched by a senior officer. That's like telling them. Exactly. That's like telling them, I'm going to just flip it. No, I, I understand. I understand. I understand. <laughs> so you don't have to say I know exactly here. I can hear it. You're right. You know, it's like, you know. No, I understand. However, we, the, the officers that are trained in our police department, are, they understand that these officers that are coming in are going to be their backup are going to be the ones that are responding to the community with them. They want officers that are going to be responsible, and they want officers that are going to be competent. They're not just going to pass somebody through just for the sake of, of putting, putting a guy into a, into a uniform and letting him drive around. Make a recommendation. I mean, make a recommendation. I wasn't satisfied with that answer, but OK. You can go ahead. Yeah. Make a recommendation to your police department that you have civilians serving on the recruitment board a recruitment group, you see. And if they don't allow you civilians on that, then that'll tell you something about the police department. So like civilians to, to be a part of the recruitment within the police department. So you can monitor who comes on. You follow me? Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, that makes sense to y'all. Like, yeah. I, I know, I'm trying to speak vague, but I'm trying. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for your question. <laughs> mostly is the people at the table they seem to believe the primary problems are the relationships between the police and the community. But it seems to me that the police are in a position in which they get a great deal of pressure from above and in which their rules are set by above. By politicians, by bureaucrats, by prosecutors, and by judges. 
Now, if I go down to a courtroom and I sit for several days and I keep track of the number of objections that, that judges uh, you know, admit uh, to evidence that's being given, I find that the police are very rarely objected to by judges and that prosecutors are rarely objected to, that, that most of the objections are against civilian witnesses and against the uh, against defense attorneys. And so the system it is the system often just the the judges just simply pass through the testimony of police so what without is your question? suspicion. So my okay. question is if the police want to maintain integrity and have a good relationship with the community, have any of you thought of having of, of having review boards of your social and economic superiors, that is, judging the political pressures on you and the pressures from the bureaucracy and the performance of, and the honesty of judges and prosecutors. So I haven't heard anything about this, but I think that's where the pressure is really coming from. If police, if, if many police are abusive, it's because they're not being properly overseen. By the, by the people above you. And so you, know, you have to take into account the pressures coming to you from above, not just those from the community. Who wants this one? <laughs> Michael also wants to answer it. I, I just want to answer it this way, sir. Um, prosecutors prosecute, police investigate. So the prosecutor can only investigate or prosecute what the police give them in a report of their findings. If I, if I could add to that, we just um, passed Prop 47 in California and reclassified six families into misdemeanors. We brought home 20,000 people last week from prison. 20,000 people came home last week from prison. <laughs> the ones who were against that, the ones who were against that, the DAs and the police chiefs. Okay? Rockefeller drug laws, we spent 70 years running Rockefeller, some spent 35 years running Rockefeller drug laws here in New York. Russell and myself spent seven years of those 35 years. We brought home 17,000 people in the state of New York after Rockefeller drug laws were finally repealed by David Patterson. Every single district attorney in this state was in favor of the Rockefeller drug laws, except one, David Sword in Albany County. The only one, one, right? So to this gentleman who asked a question about politics and policy, we actually are seeing a moment right now when we can make some change. Republicans and Democrats, we have Newt Gingrich on our side in California. We have Rand Paul on our side in California. There are Republicans who are coming to the table on economics. Fair enough, let that, let that be their issue. We come from a morality issue, they come from economics, we can make some change. The, if, if we went back 30 years, when he said, when, when President Nixon declared the war on drugs, and we had 500,000 people incarcerated at that time, now we have 2.2 million. If we only had 500,000 people incarcerated in America today, would we have a police problem? Would we have militarization of police? Mm -hmm. The war on drugs put 2.2 million people, instead of looking at those who are using drugs as criminals, they have a disease, put them in rehab. Right? So I would, I would argue that as nonprofit people, our job is to put ourselves out of business. If we have anti-poverty programs, our job is to solve poverty and put ourselves out of business. Police jobs should put themselves out of business. In 40 years from now, we should not have 40,000 police officers in New York City. If crime is going down, we need less cops. That's right. And that should be your goal. Okay. And I just want to let you know, if there are anybody on the panel that has to leave and you see them get up, it's just because they have a prior commitment. It's not that they're walking out of it. Okay? Next question? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Elsa Cruz. The wife of um, Samuel Cruz that was murdered uh, last May 26, 2013. Um, I'm listening about respect, Sorry if you lost. respect and uh, trust. I'm very sorry that uh, the kind of words to me now is uh, a big question because um, when I called the, the presence of the police and the time, the first, the first thing is that they are asking me, what is the, the race of your husband? I was 
surprise. He said, it's a Puerto Rican. And then, he's your husband. He's a, um, he's a violent man. He, he has a gun. I question myself. I called them for help to send my husband to the hospital. I was sad because I, this kind of people that I call, called, they have complete trigger in their body and they have a shield. It seems that they're gonna go to war. Not to respond to the needs of my husband. And my question is, if you, if you are a policeman and you hurt somebody, you have to give, or you have to prepare somebody when you hurt somebody, you prepare somebody to took that person and send it to the hospital immediately. My husband never gave the, the time they stayed in the apartment. And I was seeing my husband, the blood is coming out in the breast, you know, it affected me until now. So my question is, they should be coordinated with the, the police and the medical team. Mm. If they hurt somebody, if they kill somebody, or whatever, they should prepare it and bring it away, or immediately in the hospital. My guilt story is because I, I called the help for my husband, and nobody said it immediately in the hospital. So that is the biggest guilt in my life that I never, never want to call the police. I said to myself, I'd rather call somebody than the policeman. between medics and police. Oh, like that. One, one second. I, I just want to kind of clarify what it is that she's really speaking to because in Westchester County, the crisis mobile teams have been disbanded. You only have one team, and that's Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. So if they're upstate and you have a crisis in Yonkers, who deals with that situation? So what she's asking, I guess, and maybe I'm asking that same question as well, is that are you in favor, and Chris, we've had this conversation already, but are you other departments in favor of going to the legislators, going to these county executives, and demanding that these crisis mobile teams be reinstated? Because I think that's a plus for both sides. I I'd like to talk about what we're doing in Troy, and actually, it's a movement that started in Rochester, at Rochester PD about seven years ago. There's a program that's called um, emergency, emergency, Emotionally Disturbed Response Team. And what they are, they're officers that receive a week's worth of training in how to deal with people that are suffer from, suffering from emotional difficulties. And I'm very proud to say that out of the 130 officers in the Detroit Police Department so far, we have about 70 that have been trained. We just graduated 10 last week. It was a school that we hold once a year and have opened up to different um, agencies also. And to answer your question, I, I don't know much, but we don't have, in our area, we don't have the uh, crisis intervention team, but certainly there needs to be a, a different response, something that's atypical law, for, law enforcement response in that area. But our team has worked. That concept is worth great because you actually have patrol cops and first responders that are now specifically trained to deal with this element. And it's worked out very well. I would encourage any department, um, certainly my colleagues sitting here today, we would send them a program. And we do the training in-house um, with our, our county mental, mental hygiene people, and we still um, bring in instructors from Rochester CD. It's a phenomenal program, um, and it's a much more humane treatment of people that are, that are dealing with emotional issues. You know, if I could just comment quickly about uh, the local condition, Ken and I have had conversations about it. Several years ago, the Westchester County crisis team was disbanded. And as far as I know, I was not chief of police at the time, but every chief of police in Westchester County wrote to the county executive to get that reinstated. Uh, it didn't happen. It's a huge loss for law enforcement. Uh, we welcome the assistant. It's a great resource for us and uh, it's sorely missed. Thank you. The, the only thing I would add is that when, when I was uh, a young police officer, we had the crisis teams that would come all the time. 
And the police only got involved when it became necessary for the police to be involved, when the crisis teams were brought out to the scene. I don't know what their numbers were, but I can tell you that it wasn't every day that we were dealing with people who were emotionally disturbed. It, it was handled by the crisis teams. They were calls for ambulances or some, or some standby assistance, but uh, that would definitely be something that we could, we could use. And I can also just ask the community, we could use your help in getting this reinstated. We need your help. I think that statistically, the emotionally disturbed person calls are up in the advent of uh, prescription drug abuse and, uh, and for other reasons. Our call volume is up uh, for these uh, type of calls. We have time for two more questions. Okay, I'm gonna make this brief. My name's Mike Cannon. I'm a former police officer, city of White Plains. Uh, great. Reverend Williamson asked the question to the panel that they couldn't, shouldn't have to answer why there isn't anyone here from the White Plains Police Department when this great event is hosted in their city. <laughs> Personal knowledge, I know that Commissioner Chong, Chief Bradley, and he could send the less than 1.5 miles from where we are now, or less than a mile away from where they work. Uh, the Bible teaches us that you show your love by the deeds that you do, and you can see by their deeds, they do not care about race relations in their city or police community relations in their city. Seeing before me here today the great diversity, the many different groups of people, whether it be law enforcement and the citizens, or whether it be of different races, different creeds, or different beliefs. Now, within each of these groups, it's easy to find commonalities, things that we have in common. Police officers can talk to other police officers and understand each other. But once we start crossing these lines, it becomes a little more difficult, harder to relate to each other. So my question is, to everyone in this room and anyone who hears my words, especially for the police officers and everyone in authority, because they have a duty and a responsibility to, for those under them, why should I trust you? And what will it take for you to trust me? as simple as we can get. <laughs> I think you should trust me because I lost my career. I'm sticking up for a person who was wrongfully arrested. A uh, gentleman was, uh, came to me after the fact. I helped him lodge his complaint that led to the retaliation against me inside my police uh, division because I assisted that uh, citizen. And in terms of you or me respecting trusting you, because you had the courage to come to the mic and offer that, uh, that whole entire question, and I appreciate that. I think you should trust me because I stand on my record, and I will trust you because I'm sworn, I'm sworn to do so. Whether or not I trust you, I'm sworn to protect you, but I'd much rather do because I get to know you. that 
I have walked my son into? How do I learn to trust them to help him and you haven't done anything to try, try to address a problem that's very prevalent in the community. Emotionally disturbed people have the same rights we do. The same rights we do. And you don't realize how much damage you do to a community when you maim and kill innocent people. My life has been changed. For a month ago, Till today, I'm a completely different person. And I don't ever want to see anybody. I, don't, I really wish that nobody has to experience what my son is going through and my family is going through. And, and, and this is what I, I, I'm coming to you about because if we just take a little bit of time and put a little bit of thought into it, I think that we can save these people. And I'm asking, has that ever been a consideration with all of these years with one crisis team in Westchester County? And some policemen that you have on, uh, I guess, their probation for 18 months, what happens when they go out to a call like that? Or maybe some of the policemen that uh, have had questionable history, what happens when they go out on a call like that? Well, let's find out. <clears throat> within the City of Melbourne Police Department, we have a victim assistance program that's right within the Police Department itself. Um, we try to offer services to the homeless, to the mentally ill, and the people that we deal with every day. Uh, your situation is tragic, but it's not indicative of the broader picture of what happens when we deal with the mentally ill with the drug abusers and with the sick. There's a bigger picture with that and it's not just a policing problem, all right? It's a social service pro problem. Uh, we have homeless people in the city of Mount Vernon that are mentally ill that we offer services to. It's not a police thing. It's a, it's a well-being thing. And we take them to the hospital, not the jails. So do the officers have to call the victim services program? No. To have somebody go out? No. If we identify somebody in the specific set I'm talking about that's mentally ill, we can take them to a hospital. Okay. We can take them to a hospital, we can, uh, and it's not an arrest situation. It's an aided case. This is a person that needs help, not a call or an arrest, and to be brought into a cell. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Roger Crossland, and um, that's my brother Greg. Um, I worked for the MTA for 28 years. In that 28 years, every year we had to go through tests to be recertified. And that, when he said about recertification, that just brought to my mind all railroad employees who have people's lives in their hand have to be recertified. As a conductor or engineer, I had to take a test, and if you made a mistake, and broke one of the rules, you could be out of service. If someone got hurt on your train, you could be out of service with no pay. So I'm trying to figure out, as a policeman, what happens to a policeman who breaks one of the rules or is under an investigation. As a conductor for 28 years, I've had four investigations, which I was cleared of, but I was out of service without pay until they found out what happened. So you want to know what happens to a police officer? So what happens happen? to a police officer? Why are they allowed to continue to work or get paid until there's an investigation? Right. And even if they are found wrong when they've done this, how many times can they do it before they're finally let go? As a, a railroad employee, you get two strikes. That's it. The first time you get recertified, you get retrained. Second time you get done. Right. I think. To answer your question in the first part, a police officer in the state of New York can only be suspended 30 days without pay. Then he has to be restored back to the payroll. That's law. You know? so, so. so what we do in Troy, depending on the severity of the incident, he stays home and we pay him. We're not going to bring him back if his conduct is that egregious that we had to suspend him in the first place. And what most people don't realize is that the decision to fire a police officer is most often left to an independent arbitrator, and not really to the chief of police. It's left to the mayor um, or whoever else has a municipality. 
So we, while we may, may make recommendations, certainly nothing would assure that that's going to be followed. So there's different complexities that come in, but I think you would so find- So is there a recertification for police in every year or every two years? There may be on certain elements of what they do, like firearms, uh, taser, EDPRT, things of that nature, but on the whole of their job, there is not. Because on my job, I always get certified on every aspect yeah, of the yeah, job. Yeah. From okay. yeah, there is yeah. Thank you for your question. This is our final question. All right, you know. Good. All right, you right. were saying trust earlier. Um, trust is hard to come by, though. Especially when the crime goes up and goes down. If you just go criminal, you've got to commit crimes. You've got to also commit crimes. It's got to be a question, though. It's got to be a question. Yeah, but, um, that's just, what, what can we do to gain your trust? I mean, the question was answered, um, you answered already, I believe. But I was a victim of, of, of wrongdoing from an officer as well, as a juvenile. I served 18 months in DFY. What's the question? What's which, which, I'm not finished. 18 months in DFY for, for drug possession that I didn't possess because an officer set me up. So when the crime rate go down, the officers bring it back up by framing the youth and people like myself that served time at 18 months of DFY with something that I never possessed in the first place. So you say trust, I mean, I can trust you, but who's going to trust them? Trust is a, uh, is a key component. However, I can agree with you. I myself can share with you the fact that based on my experience, there are people that I could not trust, will not trust, and forever until I die, will not trust. That's right. But as a whole in the police, when we look at police agencies as a whole, for the most part, most people go to work, they try to do good that day, they try to survive that day, and they go home that day. From the community perspective, from what you're saying, you're a victim. Because you got looked at for doing something that you didn't do, and then you went and served time and were punished for something that you did not do. So how can you trust ever? So let me let me let me spin it this way. If we were victims of a Holocaust, six million people died during the Holocaust, would we ever trust those people that killed us like that? Probably take thousands of years. That's the reason why we're here today, to try to go and forge those relationships based on those experiences that are real, because that is, that is paramount for the people who have never had your experience in your shoes or my experience in my shoes. They've got to hear it. People on the panel, they have to hear it. Now they have to go and decide, are we being truthful, forthright, honest? I think you are. I know I am. So it's up to them to go back to their departments. If you want to go and fire a cop, does everyone understand the easiest way to fire a cop is if he's in violation of his license to carry, a cop can no longer be a cop without a license to carry. So if a cop is out there abusing you as a citizen, violating your civil rights, commits a hate crime in uniform under the color of law is what it's called, and you file a complaint because every incident that occurs out there in the street or in a building or in the privacy of a home that violates your rights, listen to what they're saying, each and every one of them. File a complaint. Once you file your complaint, let's go through the process real quick because we haven't highlighted it. There are three different things that happen depending on your complaint. There's an administrative investigation. There's a criminal, possible criminal investigation, and there's a special investigation by the chief. Each of those investigations have start times and end times that don't have to go in, they don't have to all start at the same time or end at the same time. The problems, administratively, someone can be found, found substantiated of committing a wrongdoing, but they could be exonerated criminally. Special investigation might find that they we're exonerated. As a citizen, do you know which complaint you're receiving in the mail regarding which investigation? Correct. You usually don't. That's where the rubber meets the road. And if you don't have that information because of lack of tra transparency, you can't address the problem.
one-liner really quick. One-liner going down the road starting with Sandra. One-liner, closing thought. Organize, organize, organize. Power can only relate to an organized space. We have to keep connected and we have to keep organizing this voice of justice. Thank you for giving me this great opportunity to um, speak. I want to say to the family who lost a loved one that this is the reason why we're here, so that no one has to face what they experience. It's going to take every one of us to make this a reality, and it starts with being proactive and not reactive. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize the families who have lost their loved ones. Um, and I'm honored to be a part of this community forum and your guests. Proactive, the communities should be proactive, very, very proactive. You, you must establish what I call a social contract within your own neighborhoods and communities so that you can understand and identify the problems and then take action from there. Communication and continue to have these forums. Continue to invite law enforcement. Maybe we'll get more to show up next time. Thank you again for inviting us. I'm honored to be here today, especially not being from the area. I'd like to come back next year and see what progress you have made to be able to tell you what progress we have made. Thank you. Network, network, network. If you have a network of knowledgeable people to fill the gaps and voids in your knowledge base, you protect yourself. I'm so happy to see people here and what you're wearing. I'm present with respect and faith. So thank you for showing up. That is the first step. And I think that all of us, you know, each individual can go out and we can try as much as we can to create change. So hopefully we will see a difference next time we do this.